I want you to open your Bibles with me this evening in 2 Timothy and the chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want you to follow us, please, in the reading of God's precious and God's infallible word here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, a familiar passage of God's precious word. Just follow the reading of God's truth with us this evening. Paul, writing to young Timothy, says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, uh, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things and your afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And we know that God himself will add his blessing to the reading of his precious and his infallible word. Second Timothy is the final letter uh, that Paul is writing to his young son in the faith, a young man that he had had the joy and privilege of leading to Christ, young Timothy. And we find that Paul is writing and penning uh, this final letter. And of course, he's penning it from a dungeon because he's in prison. Paul knows that when he writes this letter, very shortly after this, he is going to die a martyr's death. He's going to give up his life for the testimony and for the sake of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want in these opening verses this evening uh, to leave the message that God has laid on my heart for this service tonight. There are three things I want us to notice. First of all, Paul's charge to the minister. And then we find there's Paul's confidence as a martyr. And finally, Paul's conclusion of the matter. And so tonight, I want you to keep your Bibles open. We're here in 2 Timothy and the chapter 4. And we want to see here what Paul says. First of all, Paul's charge to or for uh, the minister. Paul gives Timothy his last charge before he is beheaded, before he dies for the gospel's sake. Do you notice the seriousness of this matter that Paul is speaking about? Notice what he says here, I charge thee, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying here, I solemnly witness, because for Paul, this is a very serious moment. This is a very solemn moment in Paul's life. Because Paul desires young Timothy to sense the importance of the moment, the seriousness of the moment. When I think of our young preachers that God is calling to take the pulpits of our land and our province as the older men step aside, there is a solemnity to it. There is a seriousness to it to realize that this is not a frivolous matter. It's a charge from God. And so we find the seriousness is drawn here. Paul is demanding that Timothy gives much attention, that Timothy gives much priority to this, because he says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, we notice the sanction of this ministry that he has, because he says, I charge thee before God. And so it is a reference to God, not only to God. He's speaking, look at the rest of the verse. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And of course, Paul is reminding young Timothy, there's a day when we have to give an account of ourselves. The preacher will stand before God and give an account of his stewardship, his faithfulness to the preaching of the gospel 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a solemn responsibility is laid upon any man's shoulder because, he says, I charge thee before God. This is a God-given ministry. This is a God-sanctioned ministry. This is a God-sealed ministry that this young man has been called to. And Paul's laying down, the, as it were, the, the mantle, and he's handing over uh, the baton to this young man. And he reminds Timothy of a very solemn reality. He's reminding him of a day. He's reminding of, of a day when he's going to give an account of himself and of his stewardship to God. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And that's what God requires us. That's what uh, writing and uh, John uh, on the Isle of Patmos, and he got a vision there, and the, 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 the vision there in chapter 2 of Revelation, verse 10, it says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Let me tell you, my friends, to men who stand behind the sacred desk, God is not asking them to be successful. And God's not calling them to be popular. But God is calling them to be faithful. And he says, I charge thee. Here is a solemn charge to a young man. And this is what the charge is. Notice what he says. I charge you before God. He says, verse 2, he says, preach the word. And here's the charge that God has given. Here is the style of his ministry. Notice the first word. Preach the word. Preach. And here's the style of the minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that word preach is from a Greek word which means hurled. Hurl the word. And it speaks of a time way back in Paul's day, the emperor would send out a herald to announce or to make proclamations from himself or from the empire or from the emperor. He would send out somebody to herald it out. Now, friend, to do that, there was something that the heralder had got to do. He had got to speak with a loud, clear voice. He was on the emperor's business. And you know, sometimes people say to me, preacher, you know, you raise your voice too much. Let me tell you, my friend, the herald was to, with a loud, clear voice, he was to herald out the message from the emperor. And we are on more important business tonight. We are on the business for the king of kings. And when a man takes the pulpit to preach the gospel, he's on the king's business and God requires him. Yea, charges him. He says, preach. That's what Ulster needs, preachers. We live in a day and age, my friend, let me tell you this, that people stand in the pulpits and all they say, you know, think they're very modern when they say, we're just going to have a wee chat this morning. Let me tell you, the man standing in the pulpit's not on the pulpit to have a chat. He's in the pulpit to preach. And I know there are a lot of places tonight, and let me tell you this, the Word of God's the last thing, and my, we'll just have a wee closing word, and that's exactly what it is. Just a wee sermonette. Satisfies everybody. Oh, they'll spend the rest of the meeting and they'll sing. And I love singing. But let me tell you, my friend, the central part of our worship is the preaching. This is a preaching house. That's why in our, in our churches, the pulpit's in the center. Because they're to be heralders of the Word. They're to be preachers of the Word. They're to herald out the message in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But all oh, these modern chat, you know, these, these boys stand in the pulpit. Now we see a pilot, and they don't even wear a tie anymore. They just open that show. Oh, we're just having a wee chat. We're having a wee dialogue with a congregation. I want to tell you, my friend, they're there to preach. We need men, and we need men that are called of God to stand up. We're not to negotiate in the pulpit and tell people, well, you know, God doesn't take sin seriously. We're to hurl the word. We're to hurl it out. It's the words, not ours. It's God's. We're to preach it. Now, I want you to notice this. Not only the style, notice the substance. He says, preach the word. And friend, that's what we have to do today. We're to preach the word of God because the preacher is to present the word of God. We're to preach this book. Some men stand, you know, today and they, in their wee sermonette to do a wee book review. Or they talk about maybe the latest thing that's maybe on the television or the latest thing that's on the news or anything else. Let me tell you, friend, that's what I'm here for. 
I'm here to preach the Word. It's the Word of God. And the Word of God that doesn't change, we can't change the message. Why? Because the message is the Scriptures. And if a a pulpit sticks true to the book and to the blood of Christ, friend, it'll not be a changed message. It'll be a simple declaration of God's Word. Salvation through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, Timothy, I want you to preach the Word. Preach. That's the style. Preach the Word. That's the substance. Notice the next thing, the season. He says, preach it in season and out of season. What's he saying there, friend? We're to preach the word. We're to take every opportunity regardless of the season. There is not a closed season for the preaching of the word. It's sad today when it comes to summertime. Place is closed down now. We don't have an evening service. We don't have this. We don't have, you know, because... You know, it's not, we're out sunning ourselves and we don't give place to God. I want to tell you, you're to preach the word in season, out of season. In other words, there's not a season, friend. Summer doesn't change the necessity. Summer doesn't change the calling of the, uh, the church of Jesus Christ to have the preaching of the word of God. But alas, many eliminate the preaching from their services or their programs. And yet, that's the calling of God. Notice the scope here. Look at the verse 2 again. He says, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. He says, reprove. And he says, rebuke. What does that mean, friend? The pulpit is to preach what the book says about sin. We're to reprove and rebuke in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And friend, let me tell you, sin is still sin as far as God's concerned. And God hates sin. And God will judge sin. And sin will damn the sinner if it's not repented of, if it's not turned from. But what is the pulpit to do? It's got to preach the word and reprove. And you've got to rebuke in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, friend. You do it in love. You do it because you love the sinner. If a man is blind and he's walking toward a precipice, and he's in danger, and he's about to see, as he walks in his blindness, and he can't see, and he's heading toward the precipice, and he's about to fall over the precipice and die. Tell me this. You say, just let him go on. I love him too much. You know, if I told him about that precipice, I'd only startle him. I'd only make him afraid, so I'd just let him go on, friend, let me tell you. And there he does, he just drops over. And he's destroyed. It's sad to say that's what many preachers are. They're afraid of annoying the congregation because, you see, they want to be well thought of. They don't want to preach against sin. They won't reprove. They won't rebuke sin. And so they're silent. And so the sinner just goes on. And last of all, they drop into hell. And they'll be damned for all eternity. And I'll tell you this down in hell, friend. The sinner that was in the the pew will curse the man in the pulpit that he didn't tell him the truth because he's lost. Only a man, if only they told me, if only they warned me, and did not let me go on in my sin carelessly and heedlessly. If only they told me there's a Savior from sin. If only it have warned me that the only, only the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, can cleanse from sin. But sad to say, friend, the pulpit's silent. And Paul said, Timothy, you reprove and you rebuke in my name, in the Savior's name. And then he said this, exhort. That's the next word. You know what that means, friend? It's this, plead. Entreat. It means invite them to come. And I'm glad tonight I can stand in this pulpit tonight and I beg you in Jesus' name, friend, I beg you in Jesus' name, come to Christ, sinner. I beg you to come. 
There's life for a look at the crucified one. There's nobody can save you but Jesus, friend. You'll never work off your sin. You'll never, my friend, get rid of your sin. Sin, my friend, is that disease which engulfs you and will take you to hell. You need to run to Jesus. And I beg you tonight, I beg you in God's name, come to Christ. Jesus really saves. Jesus really delivers from the power and from the pollution of your sin. And so Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, I beg, tell them, tell them of Jesus. Tell them, beg them to come, plead with a sinner. Paul was writing, and he says this, I beseech you, I beg you, by the mercies of God. Oh, friend, tonight I stand on this pulpit and in God's name I would exhort you. And notice how he's to do it. Look at the next thing. He's to preach the word. He's to be innocent in season, out of season. He's to reprove, rebuke. He's to exhort. But he's to do it with all long suffering. What does that mean? He's to do it with love and with patience. Long suffering. You know, friend, tonight, you and I need patience. And the preacher needs patience. Because let me tell you, do you remember what the disciples said to the Lord Jesus whenever they had fished all night? And friend, they were tired. And they were washing the nets and they were putting them away. And the disciples said to Jesus, we have fished all night and we have caught nothing. What does Paul say to Timothy? Timothy, you preach with long suffering. Stick at it, lad. Stick at it. Sometime the tide will go out. And there are other times under God the tide will come in. But whether it's in season, whether it's out of season, young lad, stick at it. Stick at it. That's something we need today. Something, my friend, that we need among the people of God is stickability. In hard times, as well as good times, in rough paths, as well as smooth paths, stick at it. And that's what he's saying. Do it with all long suffering. Be patient. Don't lose heart. Notice what the Word of God says. Be not weary and well doing. For in due season, you'll reap if you faint not. And sad to say, there have been men and there have been women in the work of God, friend, and they've fainted by the way. And yet God says, you will reap in due season if you feel not. Preach with all long suffering. And notice the next thing. And doctrine. You see, friend, be honest before God. There are many preach or they stand up on a pulpit to preach and they have no sound foundation of their message because they've gone away from the word of God they'll talk about the theories of man they'll talk about the philosophies of man they'll talk about the thinking and the reasons of man and they'll go away from the word of God let me tell you preach the word in the preach sound doctrine there has to be a, a firm there has to be a solid substance there has to be a firm foundation for their message so easy to be long and sound, friend, and short on substance. You know, whenever the Lord Jesus Christ went back to heaven, and it tells us that the saints of God continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers. Do you know what the Holy Ghost put first? 
doctrine. Now, there's a lot of people today, let me tell you this, and they say, oh, we don't do doctrine. They don't want to talk about doctrine. Do you know why? Because they don't know what it is. Or they don't want you to search out what their teaching is. Because you'd find out that their doctrine is not sound doctrine. Because there's no firm foundation. And Paul writing to young Timothy, not only do we have there the uh, style of his preaching and the substance of his preaching, there's the season of his preaching, there's the scope of his preaching. He's to preach the word. Now, why did, why did Paul say this to young Timothy? Because, friend, let me tell you this. He was predicting a wavering, a falling away. That's what he was predicting. Notice the next verse. He says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they after their own lusts. Shall they heap to themselves teaching or having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables? Here's a rejection of the truth. He says they will not endure sound doctrine. You see that word sound? It means wholesome. It means healthy. In other words, they will cease to be interested. They will cease to be dedicated to sound doctrine because they're not willing to stand up for the truth. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And brethren and sisters in Christ, we must never be ashamed of Jesus. Never be ashamed of who he is. Never be ashamed of what he did. Hallelujah. Thank God we should proclaim it everywhere that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And Paul was saying, you know, the time's coming, Timothy. And they're not going to endure sound doctrine. They don't want it anymore. They're not interested in doctrine anymore. But after their own lusts. After their own lusts to satisfy themselves. And they'll heap to themselves. You see, what happens is, notice what it says, they'll not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers. In other words, they'll walk away from sound teaching and they will heap to themselves teachers. What does it mean, heap? Ah, yes, there's a great number of them. Oh, there'll be plenty of preachers but they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And sadly, they turn away. They refuse the truth. And they want to hear err. Why? Because it's after their own lusts. Friend, listen. It doesn't suit their sin. Whenever it doesn't suit their sin, They'll go where they can be satisfied. It'll not ruffle their cage. It'll not make them annoyed. It'll not convict them. They can go to sleep because they have teachers tickling their ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. That's apostasy, friend. And that's what's happening in our nation. And that's what's happening across the world. There are many who are turning away from the truth. And they're getting satisfaction. Yes, they'll be satisfied because they will heap to themselves teachers who will tell them just what they want to hear. It'll satisfy them. And they'll go home happy. But they'll reject the truth. Now, Paul gives a warning here, verse 5, to young Timothy. He says this. He says, Timothy, yes, that's what happened. They will heap to themselves. Yes, it's easy to point the finger at others, isn't it? What does Paul say in verse 5? 
but watch thou. That's not for somebody else, friend. He's now looking at young Timothy and he's saying, Young Timothy, watch thou. And the word there is be vigilant. Be wakeful. Take good heed of what is happening around you. You see, the Bible says, He that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. And friend, I thank God tonight that we're not tied up in the ecumenical movement. I thank God we're not a part of the apostate system. But we've got to be careful. We need to be careful. Because we have nothing to boast in but in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our glory is in the cross. Our glory is in Christ. Take the Lord Jesus Christ away from the preacher's message tonight and have nothing to say. Take away the blood from the message of the gospel preacher. And what has he to offer sinners? Nothing. For it's the blood that makes atonement. It's the blood that cleanses from all sin. It's the blood that pardons and makes us clean. Now are ye clean through the blood. And so he says, young Timothy, watch thou, be careful. And I ask you as God's people, pray for our young preachers that come to the pulpit. Pray that God will help them to watch and be sober and to be wakeful and to be watchful and to be vigilant that they will not be tripped up by the devil, that we will not, as it were, lighten the message just to to get a people or to get a crowd. But he says, Timothy, not only watch, he says, endure affliction. And here's an old warrior, friend. Here's an old battler for Christ. And he said, let me tell you, young Timothy, the ministry's not easy. If you're faithful to the Lord, there will be problems. And there will be hardships. But Timothy, you can't compromise your message. You can't compromise what God has given you to preach. He says, you endure affliction. And even though people curse you and malign you and people laugh at you and mock at you, people turn away from you. Timothy, endure affliction. If that's what it is to be faithful to Christ, if you have to endure affliction for Jesus' sake, then rejoice that you're counted worthy. Endure affliction. And then he says this, Do the work of an evangelist. In other words, keep preaching good news. Never lose your zeal for the lost. Never lose your love for sinners. And I pray, God, that I will never, ever in my life, friend, lose my love for the lost and the desire to win them for the Lord Jesus Christ. Do the work of an evangelist. And then he says this. Make full proof of your ministry. Perform your charge fully, Timothy. Keep going to the last. And friend, look back over the history of time. And you'll find that there were many who started well. And where are they today? Lost the vision. Lost the passion. Lost the love for Christ and for souls. He says, Timothy, make full proof of your ministry. And then he said this, and this is the Paul's confidence as a martyr. Look at verse 6, and this is so important. This is what I want to leave you tonight. He said this. He says, Timothy, for I am now ready. I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. Notice those words. I am now ready. I'm now ready. 
What did he mean, friend? Well, I believe he could say that in reference to his salvation. You see, there was a time when Paul was not ready. There was a time when Paul was in the depths of sin. Until one day in the Damascus Road, the Lord met him, and praise God, on that Damascus Road, Paul was gloriously, the, the Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, he, his, he, he was completely changed. Thank God he was visited by the Lord, and he fell off the horse, and he fell on his face, and he was brought under conviction of sin, and he cried out to the Lord. He said, Who art thou, Lord? My, he was the bold, strong Saul of Tarsus going down the Damascus road to, to, to persecute and to, to terrorize the saints of God and those that love Jesus. And now we see him lying on the ground, trembling. God has brought him on to conviction of his sin. And he cries out, Who art thy Lord? Yes, he not only was convicted, thank God he was concerned. And you know, there are people tonight, let me tell you, they might be convicted, but I'll tell you, they're not really concerned about their soul. They know that they're a sinner. They're convicted. They know that they're lost. They know that they're without Jesus Christ. They know if they die without Jesus Christ, to be lost in hell forever. But they're not concerned to do anything about it. And here was a man, and he cries from the ground, and he looks up, and his eyes were blinded. Because the light has shone into his heart. The light shone from heaven. Oh, that the light of God's word would shine right into the depths of your soul tonight and reveal unto you Jesus. And he cried out. He said, Lord, who art thou, Lord? Who are you? Thank God he not only was convicted and concerned, thank God he was converted. Because that in the Damascus Road, he was gloriously transformed by the power of Christ. He became a child of God. He was gloriously saved. And from that moment, from that moment on, thank God, Paul could say, I'm now ready. Hallelujah. I'm ready. I'm ready. Because I'm saved. Resting upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. Washed in the blood of the Lamb, born of the Spirit of God. I'm ready. Can I ask you a question tonight? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you saved? If God was to call you to eternity, tonight, are you ready to go? Are you prepared to meet the Lord? Are you washed in the blood of Christ from your sin? I believe he could say, I'm, I'm now ready concerning his salvation. He could also say, I'm now ready concerning his security. Because let me tell you, friend, remember Paul was about to die. A martyr's death for the sake of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But do you notice here there's not a hint of uncertainty in his heart? What does he say? He says, I am now ready. There's certainty here. There's security here. Our sister sang the first hymn. It's well with my soul. That's what Paul's saying. He said, let me tell you, I'm ready to go. I'm going to die for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm, I'm not afraid to die. Why? Because I know I'm secure. I know that I'm ready. I'm ready. He doesn't say, I hope I'm ready. Thank God he's sure he's ready. He says, I am now ready. I'm really ready. Friend, have you that confidence tonight? Can you say like the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ? Today's game. Can you say that if the Lord was to call you right moment in this church, you drop of that seat and my, the body lie on the ground, friend, let me tell you, and loved ones pick it up and you're carried to the grave. Like, can you honestly say, absent from this body, but I'm present with my Lord. I've got security. I want to tell you, salvation is the greatest insurance policy that a man can ever have. There's no greater. For thank God this insurance policy never lets you down. God always pays out in this insurance policy. He says, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. 
I'm about to die, but I'm ready. I'm secure in Christ. My name's written in heaven. He says, I am now ready. Look at it again. I'm now ready to be offered. See, Paul knows that very shortly he's going to be offered as a sacrifice. He's going to sacrifice his life. He's going to die a martyr's death for the cause of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But thank God, not only does it refer to his salvation and security, it refers to his solace. Because he wasn't afraid. He's not lifting the fist to God and saying, God, <laughs> this is wrong here. <laughs> you, don't, you have no right to let me die. I have no right to die this way. Notice, friend, Paul's about to die a martyr's death. He's not going to be dragged screaming to his death. Praise God, he has peace. He can lift his face toward heaven. And he can say, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Because he's the comfort. He's going home. When I saw our friend Tommy Scott in hospital there recently and came back to the Lord and that day before he died, or the evening before he died, he said to me, he says, you know, Brother William, he says, I'm not going to a strange land. I'm not going to a place I know not of. He says, I'm going home. That's the solace of the scripture. To face death, friend. And it is true, we don't like to say goodbye to our loved ones. We don't like to say farewell for this scene of time to them. We don't like to let go. But my, isn't it good to know that we're ready to go? I love this statement concerning Stephen. And you know, Stephen was stoned. And as those men were hurling the stones against him, and Stephen knelt down before he fell down on the ground and died. And Stephen said, Father, forgive them. And then he said this, Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then it says, the Holy Ghost says this, And he fell asleep. There was no fear in Stephen's heart. He's going home. And that's what Paul's saying, friend. Timothy. I've fought a good fight. And that brings me to the last thing. Paul's conclusion of the matter. He says, I've fought a good fight. And for a moment, he looks back over his life. Battling for the Lord. And thank God there's no regrets here. He says, I've fought a good fight. He says, I've finished my course. And I've kept the faith. But before he says that, I want you to notice one little thought as we close. In that ver verse 6, I am now ready to be offered. He said this, And the time of my departure is at hand. He knew that death was close. Not many days left. Not many more opportunities to preach or to plead or to pray. Notice the wee word he says. He says, the time of my departure. Friend, it was a set time. He did not go one moment before the Lord had planned for him to go. 
it was a set time. The book of Job says, God hath appointed a bounds, which he cannot pass. It's interesting concerning the Lord Jesus in the scriptures. Remember the Lord Jesus said in John chapter 2, 4, Mine hour is not yet come. And then in John 17, the high priestly prayer, he said, Father, the hour is come. And then in Mark's gospel, chapter 14, he turns to his disciples, says, the hour is come. You see, it's a set time. And then I'll stay here in this world as long as God has planned for me. And then I'll go. And for Paul, it was time to go. But here's the little thought is this. Paul says the time of my departure is at hand. Paul knew he was near death. Tell me. Do you? Do you know how close you are? Do you know what tonight will really bring for you, friend? If you lay your head on the pillow and are you sure? That you will see the light of another day, and yet you have promised your soul, when I have a convenient season, I'll call on the Lord, I'll get ready, I'll get saved when I'm ready to go. Let me tell you, my friend, Paul said, the time of my departure, there's a set time, not set by man, friend, set by God. And it's a sure time, it can't be avoided. He had to answer call. And yet Paul says, listen, don't worry about me. Don't worry. I'm ready. I'm ready. Friend, what a message to leave with young Timothy from an old warrior. Timothy, I'm handing the baton over to you, son. You're my son in the faith. And I'm handing the baton over to you. He says, As from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, stick to the book, preach the book, Timothy. Be faithful to the last. Because the time of my departure is at hand. And I'm ready to go. Here's my last thought. Listen, friend. When we depart, that doesn't mean annihilation. When I depart from the shore here in Ulster to go somewhere, I'm going on a journey. I'm going from one point to the other. And when I depart this life, friend, I leave the shore of time. But praise God, I go to my eternal home. And that's what Paul will say. The old tent pegs are lifting up, Timothy. And the old tent is shaking, and I can feel it. It's just about to come down. But I'm ready to go. Are you? God alone knows the tent pegs could have already lifted, friend. The old tent could fall tonight. And you'll go to eternity. And you'll either die in Christ if you're saved. Or you'll die without him. And be lost. May God save you tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless your word to our hearts. Thank you for this word that thou hast given to us. And, O oh God, help us to be faithful to the book and the blood. Help us ever to preach Christ and him crucified. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, maybe there's someone here tonight. And honestly, in your heart, the Spirit of God has spoken to you, and you've got to say, I couldn't say what Paul said, for I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Friend, in God's name, be in time.
if in sin you longer wait. You may find no open gate and your cry will be too late. I beg you be in time. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed and God's people are praying. If there's someone here tonight in the service and her sister plays that little verse just as I am without one plea. And as the music is played and the people of God are praying. I wonder if there's someone here tonight and you say, Preacher, I'm not ready but I need to be. Yes, you do, friend. But you say, I want to be ready. If there's one right now in the service, man, woman, boy or girl, and that's the cry of your heart. Preacher, I want to be ready. Lead me to Christ. I wonder, would you lift that hand above your head? Just lift it above your head that I'll see it. Young person or older person. We don't know the time. We don't know the hour. But we do know we have to go. Are you ready? If there's one in the closing second of this meeting, you say, Preacher, lead me to Jesus Christ. I wonder right now, would you raise your hand toward heaven? O Lamb of God, I come as the one. We're here to help you. I'll be in the minister's room in a few moments. Friend, don't leave without Jesus Christ. Come and slip around the side of the building and then through the door. But don't leave without Jesus. And for those who are listening in, on the World Wide Web, why don't you give us a call? 28 Please do not leave without Jesus Christ or the number. Make that call tonight. Make it tonight. May God give you grace to come. Heavenly Father, give deciding grace. May this be a night of salvation. May this be a night of restoration. Give them grace to come. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Once again, can I say, there's a number rather than I gave, if someone wants to ring in, 0287963456 is the number immediately after the service. Don't leave without Jesus Christ. Anxious soul, come and welcome to Jesus. May God bless you. Amen.